infrastructure of bear communities. President McDevitt then called the annual business meeting of membership to order minutes of the 2018 minute were unanimously approved. Treasurer Ryan Johnson delivered the treasurer's report, noting that our investments are managed by Mascoma Wealth Management. Our financial report prepared by Rust & Co. Um, CPAs may be viewed um, at our office by request. The organization's financial status is sound and assets increased this year by 188,000. For the first time in our history, assets exceeded $1 million. Hydri Tamarco reviewed two proposed changes to the bylaws, altering officer terms from two consecutive three-year terms to three consecutive two-year terms and clarifying the role of emeritus members. The changes were unanimously approved. Heidi announced that Christine is stepping down from the board and the audience thanked her for her service. The, board's rec the board recommends Rich Howarth, our speaker tonight, Chair of Environmental Sciences Department at Dartmouth to fill her slot and continue the tradition of including a member of the college's science faculty. Rich was unanimously appointed to the board. Christine adjourned the meeting, adjourned the meeting at 8.30 p.m. Submitted by me. Um, so um, are there any questions? Um, about the minutes. And Heidi, let me know if you can see. I'm not sure if I'm like seeing everyone or you can submit your comments. So um, I is there a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, I will um, move to approve the minutes and I think we need a second. I'll second. Okay, thank you. Um, and so we move to a vote and um, only Conservancy members, please vote. <clears throat> okay. And Adair, can you see the responses yet, or we need a few more seconds. Oh, you're unmuted, Adair. Sorry. Uh, we have 22 of 37 attendees. Let me just scroll through. Everyone will be a member. Great, and closing. 100% approved. So thank you very much, everyone. All right. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, okay, so the motion has passed to accept the minutes from last year. Um, and let's see our next next thing on the agenda, we have our treasurer, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Um, hi, everyone. It's uh, hard to believe that here we are a year later, um, and I think everyone's looking forward to hopefully next year being um, back in person. But um, my name's Ryan Johnson. I'm the treasurer of the Hanover Conservancy. Uh, the Conservancy is a not-for-profit organization under the IRS Code Section 501c3. This means that your contributions to the Conservancy are tax-deductible under law. The, the Conservancy's the Conservancy obtains funding to carry out its mission from three primary sources, largely contributions from the general public supplemented with investment income, local business support, and grants. The Conservancy's finance committee is comprised of volunteers and meets periodically to review the finances of the organization and set financial policies and procedures. Internal booking is done by, bookkeeping is done by an outside contractor. The Conservancy's investment portfolio consists of both restricted and unrestricted funds. The portfolio is managed by Mascoma Wealth Management according to an investment policy and guidelines approved by the board. Mascoma reports directly to our committee at least quarterly um, and, and sometimes more frequently. The Conservancy con uh, contracts with an independent CPA firm that specializes in accounting for land trusts. The firm provides the Conservancy with a financial review and also the IRS Form 990. So some highlights from our fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. Um, the Conservancy is in a sound financial position. 
its net assets, which is similar to our equity in the organization, increased during the fiscal year 2020 by approximately 100,000. This increase was driven by successful fundraising efforts consisting of membership, corporate donations, and other contributions. Due to a rising stock market and sound investment management, our investment portfolio was approximately 1.195 million at the end of our fiscal year, at our fiscal year on June 30th, topping 1.2 million shortly thereafter. While we seek and earn grants for specific land conservation and trail projects, at the end of the day, it's private donations from you all that are our primary source of support and the, for the Conservancy's work. We certainly thank each one of you as individuals and business owners who made a contribution in support of our mission. A summary of our financials can be found in our annual report and a copy of our tax returns may be reviewed at our office on Lime Road. Thank you very much. And that's it for me. We need a motion to approve and second the treasurer's report. So moved. Second. Thank you. And there'll be a poll on us. Here we go. like okay we're fine All right thank you okay great the motion passes nice job courtney with the polls it's going i think it's working smoothly thank you everybody for participating um so next on our agenda is um we have some um turnover with our board of directors as you'll see on your screen our current board of directors are on the screen um, I'm sure everybody recognizes these are your friends and neighbors. They're a very accomplished group of people. And I just feel really privileged to work with the board and our staff, um, Adair and Courtney. And so, um, but one thing uh, that we're sad to say tonight is that we are losing our board member, Stan Kala, who has been with the Conservancy for eight years. Um, he's been on our strategic planning committee, the governance committee, the development committee. We're really thankful that Stan is going to stay on the development committee um, and keep keep bringing that, his expertise to that committee. He's been a wonderful leader in the organization and uh, we will miss Stan dearly. And, um, but I am pleased to announce that we have stepping up to fill Stan's spot is um, the board has voted to recommend to the members, Steve Lebrano to Steve's spot, I mean, to Stan's spot. Steve is the executive director of infrastructure and operations at the Talk Business School and a Talk graduate himself. Um, after graduating from talk, he moved back to the area and speaks really thoughtfully and heartfelt, has a real heartfelt connection to Hanover and the natural spaces um, that draws him to Hanover. When you can just tell when he speaks about the land and the community, how much he cares for it and what an asset he will be to our organization. Um, he's been a former chair of the board of the Howe Library. Steve and his wife Allegra live on Goodfellow Road and they own about 500 acres of conserved lands with public trails in the Huntington Hill area. Um, some of my favorite areas in Hanover where I spend many, almost, uh, almost daily on these trails over that they maintain there. They're really gorgeous in the Upper Slate Brook area. So if you haven't been there, recommended. And um, Steve's nomination has been moved by Stan Kala and seconded by Ann Malenka. So uh, now one more vote. We'd like the Hanover Conservancy members, all of you out there to vote on the poll um, on Steve's nomination. Should pop up. Okay, great. That was that was really quick. Um, the nomination passes, and we will welcome Steve starting in January. Thank you. Okay, um, so Adair, I think we have gone through the business part of the the meeting, except for now to move to Adair is going to give us some highlights of the past year. Thank you. 
Uh, and I want to uh, point out that a number of the beautiful photographs that, you're, that you have seen already, including this one here, uh, were taken by a rich, rich Howard's wife, Kari Osmus, and uh, she's a remarkable photographer and we've included her work in our annual report. Um, quickly, uh, land conservation. You know this is uh, what we do, protecting land and water in our community. Uh, this year certainly reminded everyone the importance of protected, open, accessible land. We worked on several projects this year, but none of them more exciting right now than the Makebrook Community Forest. Our organization's actually been working on it for a generation, and now because of such strong community support, 250 acres will be permanently protected uh, starting in about late January, early February. Can't get out there yet, but it will happen. Definitely will happen. And it was this great partnership that, that made this come about. The Hanover Conservancy is so pleased to have been able to work with the town of Hanover and the Trust for Public Land to get this done. Beautiful wildlife habitat. You see bobcat tracks on the upper left, um, a long stretch of Mink Brook's main stem there, and then some really dramatic geological features and ledges uh, on the northern parcel in particular. Well, also strengthening a conservation ethic in our community is what we do. And you need to get them young, of course. Um, this is a group of Wednesday wanderers who go out with our program coordinator, Courtney Dragon. Uh, who have a wonderful time outside discovering their and increasing their comfort level um, being outside and learning a couple of good things um, along the way. This of course was cut short last spring when school was closed, but it's now back in a modified version. Our outdoor trips are nearly a 60 year old tradition with us. And we got off to a good start again this year with a, a wildlife tracking trip to our Tunis Brook Mill lot. Uh, but then when the pandemic uh, threatened to keep us in, we found ways to get around it. And one of them was to really focus on our series of Hanover Hikes of the Month. We've been doing this for uh, three or four years, but we really ramped up our, our production of these, including some on Steve Lebrano's property at Huntington Hill. Um, and it was picked up by the Hare and Hanover magazine that um, did a feature on our project here. The idea is that you download um, a, a short guide from our website and you go out with step-by-step -step directions, can't get lost, uh, and there's a good backstory on what you're going to see. And uh, you go on your own time, in your own space, with the, with the people in your bubble. Another thing that was helpful this year was the Hanover Trails Challenge. And in its seventh year, we had record numbers of people participate. Uh, these three, four participants, I should say, are Heidi's children and their new puppy, Rocco. Uh, Rocco, I think, was the one there who did spot the challenge um, thing on the tree. Uh, the girls maybe noticed it later, but it was a great way for, for families to get outside, discover new places to um, enjoy family time together out on the trails, maybe some trails that they weren't familiar with already. And I also should say that we offered an Osher class for the very first time this year uh, we did it partly by Zoom, but then also outside on the trails in a very carefully socially distanced way. And I think people really enjoyed it. We'd like to do it again. Stewardship, um, a very important enduring part of what we do. And our trails did show evidence of the extra love they got this year from all those extra feet. Um, caring for our lands is a very important part of what we do and volunteers are essential to it. At our new property, the Britain Forest, on the northwest slope of Moose Mountain, uh, we opened a new trail. Uh, it's still a couple blazes left to add, but uh, you can see the, our Osher class enjoying um, one of the new bridges built by Hypertherm. The rest of the trail was laid out and built by the Upper Valley Trails Alliance's high school youth crew. We carefully avoided a high-use bear area here, that's Heidi's hand um, tracing some bear claw marks on a beech tree on the north part of the property. This trail runs around the south side of the property. So we're carrying, uh, being very careful about how we intersect the habitat there. And now as we are approaching our 60th year, um, we know that we've got much to look back on and a very bright future ahead. 
this is thanks to those of you who shared your thoughts through a survey and some of you who even succumbed to interviews to help us as we began to develop our new strategic plan. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming months. So look for that soon. And it's really clear that we could not do what we do without our members. Um, and it's really rewarding to welcome so many new members each year. We had 106 come in during um, our last fiscal year and 50 more have joined them since July. So that's, uh, that's really rewarding for those of us who spend a lot of time here uh, thinking about these things. So now it's my pleasure to turn this over to Rich Howarth who, as, as uh, Heidi said, is in environmental studies at uh, Dartmouth College. Um, he joined our board in January, continuing our tradition of especially science faculty on our board and immediately became an essential member of both our lands and our stewardship committees, bringing not only a broad knowledge as you might expect of a, of a professor at a major, major college of environmental issues, but also he has the gift to bring to us of a deep understanding of rural Hanover as a longtime and very observant resident of both Aetna and then Hanover Center. So I'm going to um, turn this over to Rich and cannot wait to see what he has to share with us. Let's see. All right, we, we hand it off here on the, on the screen share, which is an amazing thing in the Zoomian times, I guess, right? Uh, that's how my, the, the title of my talk, I guess, for tonight is Conservation, Sustainability, and Community. Um, and those are three words that in different ways Adair and I and others, but especially Adair and I have been discussing over the course of the last year or so. Um, and I'm also thinking about how it is that we can think about conservation in our region, but also on a much grander scale, looking forward. Um, no, noting that the path forward from where we are now is not going to look like the past, maybe not even the recent past. Um, in a sense, Adair challenged me to reflect on some themes that I've been discussing with my students um, this term um, in our introductory course, Environment and Society. Um, you should understand what environmental studies is as a field. Um, we're not working strictly in the biophysical sciences or in the social sciences or the humanities. What we're doing is integrating all of those elements in response to grand challenges that we see in the world. Um, you know, those challenges can be very local, like looking at conflicts um, over a particular easement in a particular part of town, or they can be global. And we really work, uh, our field works at all of those scales, um, you know, which is interesting. And of course, as we're doing right now, I mean, this has just been such an extraordinary year and such an extraordinary team uh, term of teaching. I'm working in a Zoom classroom, which actually has its advantages and some important disadvantages in the context of a pandemic. But also this year, you know, we've been facing questions of racial justice in an entirely new way. that's forcing all of us, including academics, and I think conservationists to rethink what do we, how do we engage with that narrative? Um, and how are conservation and social justice linked, which my talk will have something to say about. Um, you know, and then of course we're facing climate change and we have a democratic president coming in who's promising climate action. Um, it's a long game and it will be interesting to see where that goes over time. Um, so just about myself, briefly, my undergraduate work was first in ecology and in the field called science studies. Um, in graduate school, I really honed in on the economics and governance of, of environmental issues. And so I've worked the interface between ecology in particular and then economics, um, you know, for the last, well, three decades. It's, I'm getting older, which I wish, well, I guess that's better than the alternative now, isn't it? Okay, so the professor in me wants to say that we've got these big words like conservation and sustainability. And we apply them and we are passionate about what those mean in our lives and our work. But at the same time, those are big, broad words that mean many different things um, and often have carry conflictual meanings, hidden meanings, and they have histories attached to them. Um, and, my, and part of my job um, with my students, and I may be with you tonight, is to be, ask you to be very intentional about terminology and language, especially when we're speaking in code words like conservation and sustainability. 
The conservation movement occurred in the early part of the, 19, of the 1900s. And a leader in that movement was Gifford Pinchot, who was the founder of the Yale School of Forestry and the first chief of the US Forest Service. You know, and in his 1910 book, The Fight for Conservation, he offered us the following very wordy definition. Um, the conservation is about the right of the present generation to use what it needs and all it needs of the natural resources now available, recognizing equally our obligation so to use what we need that our descendants shall not be deprived of what they need. Okay, that's not very elegant writing, but there's a lot of content there and we should pay attention to that. First, for Pinchot, and I think for all of us, conservation is fundamentally about conserving natural resources for the benefit of future generations. Pinchot saw that in materialist terms. So it was about timber and it was about fish harvests and it was about water. He wasn't really interested in the environment or in ecological values as we would now understand ecological values. Um, but he did have this idea that we should focus on people's needs and that somehow that the purpose of natural resources or one part of what was important about nature was its ability to support well-being in society. Now, Leopold comes next. And probably many people, if not all of us on this, on this call or this lecture, have in, in, engaged with, with Leopold's land ethic on one, at one point or another. Um, but we don't necessarily remember that, that Leopold studied at Yale and then he worked at the Forest Service. And so he's in the next generation after Pinchot and he sees the implications of the materialist resource extractionist approach to conservation that Pinchot emphasized. And he's inventing a new land ethic, a new ecologically informed way of thinking about, I would say, conservation. So he says that a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. And we tend to often now think of him as talking about wilderness or preservation values. But actually what he's talking about is, is mostly managed landscapes. It's forests, it's rangelands, it's woodlands. And he's talking not about non-economic uses or not, not non-people um, landscapes. He's talking about how we live in harmony with landscapes, landscapes and in fact, how we um, live in community with landscapes. And actually from an academic perspective, his moral argument is fascinating. He argues that over human history, that first of all, ethics is about rules and norms within a community. First, at one point, it might've been you know, white men who own property. And he argues that over the course of human history that the idea of community has been expanded to include more people um, and a broader, you know, more inclusive, more equitable set of rules and norms. And he's arguing that actually that we need to learn how to live in community with, with the biotic community, he says. You know, and that's pretty different from Pinchot, probably quite close to how many of us on this call um, in this lecture would understand our relationship with our landscape here in Hanover um, and in the Upper Valley and in, um, you know, in, in Northern New England, which is a special place and kind of a unique place. Okay, then sustainability. This is closely related, actually. Um, I spent a lot of my early career writing theoretical papers in economics and philosophy about the concept of sustainability and its foundations and its implications. But here what I want to look at is how this word is now used in practice. It, it tends to reflect um, an attitude, a set of attitudes and a commitment to a set of values and behaviors that we would say are pro-environmental and pro-social. And so it's about changing your food systems to make them more sustainable, meaning less, less um, meat products and animal products and more vegetables. It's definitely about reducing one's carbon emissions Corporate sustainability is about, in the organizational context, how businesses can move from more polluting to cleaner technologies or low energy technologies. And so actually sustainability is a lot about how households work and how consumers make decisions. And it's about how businesses make decisions. And while part of that is in service to protecting nature, it's not directly engaged with nature when it's framed in this way, I would say. I mean, it's about how we execute our our obligations or responsibilities towards nature. But sustainability also has a social foundation and that's moving and changing and evolving in an exciting 
uh, way, maybe, well, I'll say maybe a problematic way. Maybe we should come back and talk about that in discussion. But in the, at, a, at a university like Dartmouth today, sustainability and social justice are not two separate things in the way that racial justice and conservation used to just be different planets or different universes. Now there are common conceptual frameworks emerging that locate um, sustainability questions in the same lens or address things with the same lens that gets applied to questions of race, class, gender, and sexuality. That's very challenging. Um, you know, it, 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 it's very challenging intellectually, actually, because it's a, it's a major paradigm shift in an important way. But it does carry us towards a situation where environmental racism and environmental justice are not just issues that we might address, but they're not really what conservation is about. They become actually fairly central to a certain way of understanding sustainability. You know, and we could look at US examples, and in our course this term, we were teaching about the Flint, the lead poisoning relating to the water system in Flint, Michigan, which is a classic case study, which we should interpret as a sustainability dilemma. Um, you know, and that's driven, of course, by institutional racism. Okay, but environmental justice isn't just um, in North America. You know, it's also in Africa and it's in Latin America and it's in Asia, so it's global. And I'm gonna walk you through brief, very briefly a case that I learned about um, in the context of participating in Dartmouth's uh, foreign study program in South Africa um, back in 2001. And it relates to the Makaleke people. Makaleke are an indigenous community. They're from a region called the Kafuri Triangle in South Africa. So this is at the very northern tip of what's now Kruger National Park. And it's right on the border between Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Okay, and the crux of the story goes like this. In, in 1969, the South African government forcibly removed the Makaleke people from their land and they were relocated to an area to the west and to the south that was poorer from an agricultural perspective and drier, less fertile, less ecologically abundant. Um, and the short story is what? I mean, after the change in government in South Africa in 1994 and with the new constitution that was put in place, Makaleke people got their rights back and they sued. Um, and how did that turn out? Well, the courts recognized their rights but the result wasn't that they moved back to the park. They stayed in the village that they'd been relocated to, which is probably more practical. But they got ownership rights of a certain type, type with respect to those park lands. And they, they now have a right to conduct tourism operations, for example, within this area of the Pifuri uh, Triangle. And why should we pay attention to that? I mean, these conflicts between um, um, colonization um, and indigenous communities. I mean, these are global. They're also here in our region, certainly in North America. And one of the solutions to that is what's called co-management. And co-management means um, co-management means working out cooperative relationships between indigenous communities, maybe between governments and whatnot, to achieve outcomes that can work in both sides. And in this case, we're looking at you know, like a world-class environmental site. Okay, so here are some photos that I'm not sure whether I took these pictures. Our Kari took these pictures. Uh, we've discussed Kari, my spouse, and she was also on this trip and, and we took these pictures together. Um, you know, this is a, a meeting that we have with students and the elders of the village. This is their attempt to establish a bed and breakfast to welcome guests in the village. Um, here we have an interesting photo of a relatively new dam, which was built to provide water. Um, and this is a risky spot because that reservoir then was occupied by crocodiles and by uh, um, hippopotamuses, which are dangerous if you're washing your clothes in the reservoir, which is how it was done then. Um, and then here we are, and here we're on our bus and we have our tour guide from the village. We're entering Kruger National Park to explore this amazing landscape, which is their ancestral homeland. Um, ending at this spot at the very northern tip of Kruger um, at the Limpopo River looking out, this is in South Africa, but it's looking out towards both um, Zimbabwe to the west, northwest um, and Mozambique to the, um, to the, to the northeast. Um, you know, and this is a, again, 
a spectacular world-class environmental site that's a Ramsar site, meaning that these are globally important um, wetlands. Okay, so why focus on this case? You know, this actually, as far away as it is from Hanover, this, this emphasizes or demonstrates and illustrates a kind of standard, certain kind of Western thinking about conservation or preservation that idealizes the idea that there are pristine landscapes that are untouched by human hands and that our goal is to conserve those and protect them from human influence. You know, and you know, the, the, the fact is, is that in many cases, the creation of protected areas has involved the removal or maybe the exclusion of, of indigenous people. So there are these conflicts over protected areas and indigenous rights that are messy and wherever, in, wherever colonization has incurred and settler colonialism has, has, has played out, there are these conflicts that have to be acknowledged and addressed. Okay, but this idea more quite deeply, this whole idea about, about untouched nature, that's largely a myth, right? There's not really any places on earth, a few, but very few places, even in the far north that haven't been influenced by people in one way or another. Okay, so the next part of my talk here is bringing this back to New England. And this is another book that if you haven't read it, I think you should. It's, it's William Cronin's 1903 landmark book, Changes in the Land. Um, and this starts out with an account of what, um, what natural resource management and livelihoods really looked like for Native Americans living in Northern New England um, before um, European settlement. You know, and it was, um, it was not an untouched landscape. It was a place where people lived and they practiced agriculture. Um, and in particular, they were hunters and they were gatherers. And they had a tremendous, incredible knowledge of how forests work and how to, for how to manage forests in ways that serve their interests. Um, you know, so our region has always been a landscape of forests. It's always been a landscape of, of lakes and rivers. Um, and the, you know, in that context, the Native Americans had relatively low populations, but they use fire as a management technique. So the forests that they lived in that don't exist anymore had very large mature trees with a relatively open understory, so not a lot of brushiness. And that was managed in a way that was really good in terms of wildlife, wildlife productivity and in terms of the provisioning of what we call technically non-timber uh, forest products, um, you know, so NTFPs. You know, and bringing things back to this idea of community, Native Americans certainly did not see their relationship with the land in terms of dominion or ownership. Those are ideas that come from Europe. They may come specifically from, from England, certainly in, in this region. Uh, Native Americans saw themselves as living in, within nature. And they saw themselves as having um, reciprocal relationships with other living things and maybe with nature itself. Um, and, and, and so they were, they were making use of natural resources, but they saw um, it's, uh, they participated in the, in, in the place in a, in a thick way. Okay, so we come to the late 18th century. And then of course, the, this place was occupied by European colonists, mainly people who had immigrated from England or the settlers of people who came to the coastline earlier. And they were interested in clearing forests for timber and to support farming. Um, but actually the big industry that led to the main deforestation event that occurred in interior Northern New England was about the industrial revolution. Um, and it was about um, the textile mills in the river valleys like the Merrimack River Valley um, in particular. And that wool had to come from somewhere. And where that wool came from was the hills of Vermont and Hampshire. And so when you find old stone fences in the woods, in many cases, those are barriers um, from where, um, you know, from where people cleared the land, not so much for farming, but for animal husbandry, you know, for grazing. You know, and incredibly today, 85% of our state is covered by trees. So, you know, I think of when I come home from being away, I always am grateful to be back in the sea of trees, which for me is just so very meaningful. But, you know, by the mid, in the mid 19th century, that was not what this landscape looked like. You know, that was that the tree cover was down to 45%. Along with that went um, major flooding because of water resource management and all of that. 
Um, so there are some real problems about that. And if you're interested in that, then you could read um, George Marsh's or George Perkins Marsh's book, um, Man and Nature from around that time, which is again, another step in the direction of environmental studies as a field. Um, but then what's, in, what's really interesting is what happened next. You know, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, the agricultural movement or success of this region had largely passed. And people started to move west to the Midwest. Um, you know, and, 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 and actually, even when I was a kid in the early 60s, New Hampshire and Vermont were relatively poor states, which certainly isn't true now, but was true then. Um, it's, and with that, not poverty exactly, but with that decline of, of agriculture and that depopulation, then we saw a move um, towards um, the regeneration of forests, which are not the primordial of forests that the Native Americans have lived in. They're very different forests. Um, but now we live in what we think of regionally as the working forest concept, right? And the working forest concept, it's about partly timber harvesting and timber extraction, but it's about hunting and it's about recreation and it's about a sense of relationship between communities and nature. And, you know, in this culture, when you own land, you have a right to post it. That's perfectly legal. But, you know, the, the default was, the, the default, I believe, still is in New Hampshire, that land is open to hunting and fishing unless it's posted. And you don't really want to post unless you have a real reason to do that and protecting some interest. But the, along with that goes a responsibility that, hey, you know, I'm thinking about going hunting on your land. Would that be OK? And those kinds of things were handled um, you know, through informal social norms and through this region's culture, um, which has a, you know, having grown up, not here in Hanover, but in southeastern New Hampshire, and having also lived the way, I'm fascinated by the way that there's a distinction between the a local understanding of the sense of place and what it means to come here from away and experience something that's new. Um, this is, uh, Kari and I were arguing about this tree earlier. This one is up on Cory Road which is a place that I can highly recommend for walking or especially for cross-country skiing. Um, and this is, a, we were debating, but we're pretty sure that this is an American ash and that the error can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Okay, so we'll change gears again here. And I don't wanna talk about the age of the Anthropocene um, because in environmental studies and environmental science and sustainability science, you know, our thinking has really changed a lot in the last 20 years, certainly, and even in the last 20, 10 years. I mean, so Paul Crutzen is a Nobel laureate, and he got his, his Nobel Prize for work on ozone depletion back in the, in the around 1970 or the early 1970s. But in 2002, he wrote a very prominent paper where he said that we have now entered the age of the Anthropocene. And what he meant by that was that if we go back 10,000 years, I mean, throughout the, the, um, the period of where society was mainly agrarian, the Earth's climate was suspiciously stable. You know, or over time, in, in geological history, Earth's climate goes up and down and it does all kinds of crazy things. But for the last 10,000 years, it's been relatively stable. And Crutzen's point, amongst other things, is that with the coming of the Industrial Revolution, and in particular with the invention of the steam engine, that this meant a transition to, towards a new kind of economy that was fueled not by animals and human labor from food energy, but by fossil fuels. And that this unleashed a cascade and wave after wave after wave of new technologies, and more and more resource consumption, and more and more fossil fuel consumption. And that brought on what we now think of as the age of the Anthropocene, which is partly about climate, but it's about a lot more than climate. You know, so what is that? Well, what we tell our students is these italicized points at the, at the bottom of the slide, that natural systems are now dominated really in all places, all scales by the human um, impacts of, I mean, the impacts of human activity. Um, yeah, okay. So, you know, what, how, do we, how do we understand this scientifically? You know, work at Dartmouth, Dartmouth is in some ways a powerhouse in forest ecology forest ecosystem science. Um, and we're not studying natural undisturbed forests anymore. We're trying to figure out what climate change and global environmental change and other disturbance regimes mean in this region and in other regions. You know, the bad news is that even if we 
were successful in limiting global climate change to a temperature increase of about two degrees Celsius relative to the pre-industrial norm, you know, our forests in this region are still going to evolve and change. They're gonna look different 200, 100 years from now than they did 100 years ago or than they looked three or 400 years ago. Um, and that's just a fact that we need to accept and, and deal with and I think in some ways move on with. You know, this beautiful, you know, this beautiful ash tree, you know, ash trees in our region are going to be hit in short order by emerald ash borders, borders. you know, and they're in Orange uh, County up in Vermont, for example, um, they're close to Hanover, not quite here yet. So ash trees are kind of going to be out of business because emerald ash borer has a mortality rate on ash trees of around 99%. And that's about 7% of standing timber in New Hampshire. Um, and this isn't driven by climate per se, but it's one of the number of things that are coming that will impact climate and forests along with climate change. But on the plus side, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to think that, for example, uh, this northern red oak, and I'm not sure exactly where this picture was taken, but all of these pictures from Kari were taken within walking or biking distance of our house. You know, on the plus side, northern red oaks um, might be might expand their range. You know, we have warmer winters. We look a little more like what the climate looked like in the Berkshires a while ago. Um, so it's not going to be the same, but it might be a robust and healthy, productive ecosystem. Um, you know, and of course, red oaks are keystone species because of the masting, the 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 um, acorns that they produce in a good year. Okay, and climate change. You know. We're talking about forests and whatnot, but here let's think about uh, bird populations and climate. And this is a three degree C temperature change scenario. So this is at the high end of what might be achieved if and when we start to really get the work at really reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, scientists and the Europeans, for example, are thinking about trying to shoot for two degrees C, maybe one degree C. If we, I can't click on these, but you can if you go to this website. You know, and this is what's at stake. So, I mean, this is a summer breeding habitat for common loons. Um, you know, and on the one hand, this looks not terrible in the scheme of things. Um, you know, this is analysis, I should say, from the Audubon Society, and there's a hyperlink here that people could look at. And what we see is that the, sh the range shifts north. You know, and so they lose 27% of their summer breeding range. They gain a whole bunch up north in the tundra in the Arctic, interestingly. The species as a whole is probably going to be okay, but it may or may not be in our region going forward, depending upon whether there's more or less climate change. You know, and if there's a moderate degree, like 1.5 degrees Celsius, you know, the, this analysis does suggest that we'd still have common loons here. But this is the kind of thing that's at stake from a conservation perspective with climate change. Um, okay, so this is from, um, I mean, the loon chick from not the summer of 2020, but the 20, summer of 2019. Um, you know, and they're here now. In fact, their populations are doing quite well. Thank you very much. Um, but I, what I want to convert, what I want to convince you of, I think, and it took me a while to get to this, and it's really only been in the last five years, maybe 10 years, is to let go of the idea that we can keep ecosystems the way that they have always been, or that we imagine that they have always been. They're dynamic, they're changing, that's unavoidable given changes in climate and other variables like emerald ash borer that in some sense are already locked in. But the thing is, is that we do certainly have the power to slow and limit the rate and magnitude of change. So that means pulling hard on the sustainability agenda and doing what we can to reduce our own greenhouse gas emissions uh, through energy use, maybe through promoting solar energy, uh, but also through timber and forest management practices. I'll come to that in a minute. And the good news here, I think, um, is that if we do things well, um, and we do it's not management that's well grounded in, in science, then we can be optimistic about having ecosystems that are healthy and that sustain over intergenerational timescales um, a, a flow, a sustainable flow of ecosystem services. You know, and it's what are ecosystem services? Well, it's all of the benefits, direct and indirect, um, of all kinds that human beings get from nature. 
So it's kind of a generalization of what Pinchot was writing about all those years ago um, when he was talking about our needs and about the benefits, I mean, about the importance of natural resources. So maybe you're depressed about what I just said. I said that I'm not depressed about it. Um, and so where does this process of letting go from, come from? You know, in Mekaleke, we saw how an idea about pristine, untouched nature and protecting it could lead to an exclusionary outcome. Um, and in American um, resource management and park management, we have our own issues and challenges and problems with preservation and how that intersects with, with other social interests, for example. But if you read Henry David Thoreau's essay on walking, published in 1862, he doesn't say in wilderness is the preservation of the world. People read it that way. He writes that in wildness is the preservation of the world. You know, and Thoreau was writing that from Walden Pond, which was not a wilderness. It was right near the railroad track in woods that were managed and probably had been harvested at different points in time. And what Thoreau was writing about wasn't an untouched nature. He was writing about natural processes and the miraculousness of how nature works. And, and he saw himself, I think, um, as living in relation to nature. Um, you know, and in a talk like this, I can't get past offering you this quote from Emerson, which I also share with my students. Um, and this gets at ideas that we could see as spiritual in nature. You know, Emerson writes that in the woods, we return to reason and faith, standing on the bare ground, my head bathed in the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. I am part or particle of God, he writes. I don't think that will change if we have forests in the future that are more dominated by red oaks um, than by, say, sugar maples or whatever other species there may be. But I think that we do have a responsibility to look after the health and thriving of nature, which is so very essential to the health and thriving, actually, of our communities. OK. So how do we manage forests in this region to achieve this goal of ecosystem health or to support biodiversity for that matter? You know, the Forest Service now puts biodiversity protection and conservation at the forefront of its agenda. And in the White Mountain National Forest, one of the tools they use is, tri is timber harvesting, um, ironically enough, or interestingly enough. You know, the idea here is what? that over time, the White Mountains, the forest types in the White Mountains have evolved to be more dominated by, um, by northern hardwood forests, which have their own benefits. But there's not as much spruce fir as there used to be. Um, so not as much coniferous forests. And those coniferous forests are um, of particular importance to uh, various bird species, like this magnolia warbler that we saw um, on an apple branch in our yard last, um, last spring. Um, you know, okay, so we're harvesting trees in the White Mountains. Part of the management plan is basically to, um, to harvest the hardwoods and then engage in silvicultural practices, which foster the regeneration of, of spruce and fir to maintain a mix of different forest types at the landscape scale to maintain the overall biodiversity of that region, um, which I think is, uh, I mean, that's ambitious and it's interesting and I think that reflects good ecology. Um, in my own work, I've worked very extensively on the economics and ecosystem science of, of carbon storage and forests. And in our region, in short, the number one thing that we can do to protect climate and limit the rate and, and, and scale of climate change is to maintain as much tree cover as possible and really to maintain as much carbon um, storage in, in trees as possible. Um, yeah, okay, so I've done a lot of work with my colleague, um, Dave Lutz, who came here as a, as, a, uh, as a postdoc and is now a research faculty member in environmental studies. And we did um, quite a lot of analytical work looking at trade-offs between timber harvesting and carbon uptake and storage. You know, um, and the, the punchline here, um, so this is an area of research called bioeconomic modeling. What we're doing is looking at the monetary benefits, the economic benefits that you get from timber harvest versus, um, versus carbon storage. And what we find is that in this region, typically, um, you know, 
what's best is actually either very long rotations or non-harvesting. And that this dominates certainly short rotation and clear cuts, which have been a, a practice that's been widely applied in the North Country. And if we can find ways to stop doing that in the North Country, then our work and lots of other work would suggest that that needs to um, stop, or at least it would be beneficial for that to stop. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's, it's questionable, I think, whether even traditional ideas about managing forests to maximize sustainable timber yields over time whether that's really what, what climate, responding to climate um, change really demands of us. You know, people will say, well, we don't have a carbon price um, in the Hampshire and Vermont. Well, actually we do on the California market, at least for, um, for large scale owners, and that has generated transactions in the multi-millions of dollars and, if, and, and really effective management decisions in some cases. But you know, if we're gonna go to net zero, you know, we'll be looking at much higher prices in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. Now, the thing is, is that trees are like a financial asset. The, the models that are used to value timber yields in the future are the same tools that are used in finance to think about the value of stocks and bonds, except it's a longer time horizon. And with those future higher carbon prices, um, it probably isn't gonna be economic to do a lot of timber harvesting in our region. And that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, Difficult idea in a sense, given the fact that timber harvesting and paper industry and all of that has been so central in parts of our state for so long. I'm not even necessarily offering this as a prescription, but I think it is where we're heading um, as we head into this crisis. And the, again, the future for forests in our region is not gonna look like the past. Okay, so what else can we say? I already covered the yeah, I already did the White Mountain one here. Okay, so how did I do that? I have a duplicate slide. Okay. Okay, so how do we, how, do, how might this affect Hanover and our, the way that the conservancy and decision-making at the town level might work? And of course, that's something that I've talked a lot about and Nadira and I have talked about quite a lot. You know, from a conservation biology perspective, from ecosystem science perspective, Conserving individual parcels provides benefits, but it's not that helpful. What you need is to conserve and protect landscapes. And that means preventing the parcelization of landscapes, right? And so this isn't 100 acres or 200 acres or even 500 acres. It's looking at how things play out over thousands of acres. And of course we've got on, on the plus side, we've got the all of the conservation work that's been done on, um, on Moose Mountain and the east side of Moose, Mount, Moose Mountain. Um, and so that's in good shape looking forward. But I do worry to some extent about parcelization in the rural part of Hanover. Not that there'll be a lot of new homes, and I'm actually in favor of new homes and where they can be sited appropriately. But from a conservation perspective and from a climate stabilization perspective, what matters is keeping the trees on the land and also keeping homes closer to the roads so that they don't extend into the interior of parcels and the interior areas between parcels in ways that, um, that foster um, 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 you know, fragmentation. Um, you know, and that's maybe, this, maybe that's not a new idea, maybe that is a new idea. But I do see, and particularly in this, in this market now, I do see you know, a movement towards um, larger parcels, you know, and that needs to be done in a way that's environmentally sensitive. Um, you know, how does that get done? Well, it's the, it's the Conservation Commission, it's the zoning and planning process itself. Um, it's going to be the clever use of, of conservation easements. You know, there might be, I'm speaking hypothetically now, so I'm not speaking about specifics, but it might be that instead of buying a, par a parcel fee simple, that you work with the landowner to get them to agree to put the house closer to the road, and then you can serve the back parcel. And while that takes, um, that reduces the monetary value of selling it for a clearing for a house on a hillscape with a great view, um, that might be a good investment of our community's resources. Okay, I'm almost done here. Um, okay, so again, in, in Hanover, climate change, the challenge here is not just to conserve large parcels, but to keep all landscapes intact across parcels. You know, and in New Hampshire, when so much land is owned in units of 10 acres or 20 acres or 50 acres, that's a big social and political challenge. 
I think actually that maximizing carbon storage really is this is the number one way that we in our community can contribute to climate action. Um, you know, and then, um, you know, finally here, yeah, and this is my final point, an important one, and maybe want to come back to in discussion. What we're conserving isn't just natural resources or environmentally sensitive lands or wetlands or, or magnolia warbler habitat. What we're conserving is really his, the history and meaning of landscapes. Um, in this world where we have this just phenomenally rapid ecological change and social change, you know, and those histories and meanings and the links between the community and the landscape are what makes this a community. I mean, if you grow up in small town rural New Hampshire, then a lot of that is about a culture that's about living in relation to the river and the, and the lake and the forest. Um, and, and, and somehow, even though that is evolving and should evolve and should change, I, I'd like to find us to find ways of, of hanging on to that. Um, and I also say that maybe we come back and talk in discussion. I mean, I think it's all of us need to take a good hard look at the legacy of Native Americans in this region um, and what that means um, and how we might best approach that. The answer there is actually likely to be slowly, step by step, forging um, working relationships with people. Um, and the Akaleke thing, as far away as it is and as different as that context is, what works in that space um, is, is, is sharing power, uh, sharing decision making, and doing things um, together um, in a respectful way. Um, so thank you very much for your indulgence for listening to this probably too long talk, um, but thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. So Rich, are you able to see some of the questions in the chat because you have um, You've received some questions. Okay, I can definitely feel that. I'm gonna, let me go, let's see. I'm not really having a bad Zoom moment, and I do know what I'm doing sort of, but. And so if you just stop so share, I we'll I have to hold. Stop, I think I need to stop share is what I need to do. So okay. let's do that. And then there's chat and I see 11. And then should I start from the top, I guess. Um, oh, yeah. OK, so Heidi has a question. Do we have an estimate of the percentage of tree cover in New Hampshire <clears throat> before the European settlers took it down to 45%? You know, and I mean, I guess the thing to understand here is that in this region, you know, essentially everything was trees or water, unless the beavers came along and carved out a beaver meadow. Um, and that, of course, actually contributed richly to biodiversity because they build a beaver dam and then you get this pond and this swampy system that has its own species and things going on. But essentially, it was even higher than 85% before European colonization is my understanding. Certainly in northern, the interior part of northern New England, which is kind of what I'm thinking about here. And New Hampshire, I think Maine is number one in the, in the country in terms of tree cover or forest cover, and New Hampshire second. And so we actually stand out nationally in that respect. Um, okay, so let's see, next question. Okay, so what Derek has a question about what will drive moon nesting north. Um, boy, I don't know the ecology of that. Um, change in forest fish, uh, forage fish. I mean, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> Adair, you yourself have some background in loon conservation. Um, to some extent, I put that picture in the slide deck to, uh, to draw you out, which I guess I succeeded with. <laughs> I mean, we should look and have yeah. a, look, a close look at that um, Audubon Society report um, and see um, and see what's there. I mean, what do we know about that? Um, I just wonder if it's forage fish or if we, we're going to be getting these um, uh, systemic droughts that are going to mess around with, um, uh, you know, with water levels during critical season, nesting season. Well, we do know that we do know that <clears throat> we do know that the heart of there. <clears throat> excuse me. 
The heart of their range is the northern boreal forest, and we're sort of just south of that. Um, and so they do better here than moose do, but nonetheless, they're at the, north, the southern um, end of their range. And so if I were speculating, I would think that it's just that the climate regime might not be quite right, and that maybe somehow the overall the, the landscape skill uh, effects might not be there. But that's a challenge I should look into. That's a good question. That's very typical. Yeah, I know they do, they do nest uh, in the Quabbin. They nest down in Massachusetts. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, we could go, in fact, in a minute, if we want, we could go look at the, you could actually look that up. You could go to that, uh, that, that Audubon website. And I should have, in my slide deck, I should have shown you the 1.5 degree C scenario, because in that case, you see a long tongue going down into Massachusetts, um, where the loons would probably stay here. So we could come back and look at that, at that on their website, if you'd like. Um, okay, so who's next here? The next question is from Mark. Um, he was asking about slide 20 on forestry. Uh, he said very long rotations and non-harvesting dominates in terms of what? Um, well, in terms of balancing net monetary um, benefits, in terms of, of in terms of the economics. Um, and so I'm by a disciplinary identity an environmental economist. And you know, we think about the idea that when I drive my car into my office to give a talk like this, then there's carbon emissions. And of course, we understand that there are damages imposed by that. And so we have tools and methods for assigning a monetary value to those damages. That's called the social cost of carbon. Now, the thing is, is that when I'm harvesting trees, um, the, the process is different, but the idea is much the same. That, that tree, that, that harvesting of timber um, and for, at first, and then especially over time, leads to a net release of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that has the same damages as, um, as, you know, as if I were emitting from, bur from burning fossil fuels. And I, of course, the problem here is that we, over, you, we, uh, we haven't made this, the, the transition from fossil fuels to solar energy, not because we can't do it, but it's because we haven't put a price on carbon to account for those damages. And the idea here is that if the highest and best valued use of the, of the forest or the landscape is to stabilize climate, which arguably it is, um, you know, that, that's, that's the idea here. So. It sounds like that's, that's a yes, Brian. Yes. Yeah, okay. So it's the carbon markets will be more economical than timber markets. Um, the thing is, is that prices Carbon prices are likely to get like not $13 a ton CO2, but more like $50 or $100 or $200 per ton of CO2. And the thing is that if you think about the challenge of really bringing down carbon dioxide emissions, we'll need pretty darn high prices really to make that happen. There'll be a policy decision about whether we apply those decisions or, or those prices in forestry and then how we do it. So whether it would be an offset market like the current California Air Resources Board regime. Um, but if we do, then that probably would really drive, really change the way that forestry is done. And, it, and we should also bear in mind that in the current conditions, and of course prices go up and down, that it's not any one thing at any time, but in the current market, it's hard to sell low quality wood and pulp. Um, and if you can't make a profit on pulp or you can't get payment for pulp, and it's actually also then hard to get a good profit on cutting high quality saw logs. Um, and so what happens with the timber industry in this region, I think it's, I don't think we know actually. And I, I mean, it's, uh, it's I don't think, what I think we know is that it's not going to look like it, like it traditionally did in the past. So, and, and what that means for conservation organizations, I just think that's interesting. Okay, so Tom Jack is now um, looming out there. Okay, so how do I view, Tom asks, how do you view invasive species? Um, should we just accept their introduction um, and accept changes? Perhaps it may depend on the particular species. Yeah, I would agree that it matters. Well, I, I'd say, first of all, I think in Hanover that um, invasives are a big problem that we've made some progress on, but there's a lot more work to be done. So look at the first and second reservoir properties um, which were really overrun by glossy buckthorn. Um, and how that happened was complicated, but the town and Dartmouth um, have worked very hard to come up with a revised management scheme, um, plan 
which will then restore um, better forest cover. It's linked also partly to being overrun with white-tailed deer. Um, I think it's complicated. I mean, I, I think if we have um, if we have invasive species take over everything, then I think we lose biodiversity and we lose uh, ecosystem health. Um, but on the other hand, it can be difficult and challenging and costly to fight off species like um, like Japanese knotweed, for example. I mean, there's ways to do that, but that's really hard. It's also easy cases, right? So the third hand of a reservoir um, in the early knots was starting to see a real problem with purple loosestrife. And if you, look, if you look at the reservoir in the summer now, you'll see a few purple loosestrife plants, um, but only a few. And the reason was because in one summer day, the Barbara, Barbara McElroy, with a little bit of help from me and Kari, took beetles out there with the town's permission and released them, and they established themselves. Um, and so that's a little success story, I guess. So. Okay, so Doug has a question about Flint, Michigan. Um, is there a deeper connection to, to, to sustainability than fairness and racism? Yeah, well, I mean, that gets back to, I mean, okay, there's a reason why I said that we needed to be real careful about what we mean by these words. You know, the Brundtland Commission, so the World Commission on Environment and Development defines sustainable development as development that meets present needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that sounds a lot like somebody read Pinchot, but then rewrote it to look better or read better. It's the same words almost, but actually a very different meaning. You know, and I think sustainability and sustainable development are about the environment, but they're very much about how pollution um, affects people. And Flint, Michigan is a problem of, of urban pollution in the urban environment. And so I think that people in the sustainability movement would say that, yeah, that definitely is a sustainability problem, even though it's not really an ecological problem. Um, and I also think that, I think that also that there's been historically a disjuncture in, in many cases between conservation organizations and environmental groups, which rightly or wrongly have been perceived as more white, more upper middle class, um, not necessarily very successful in being inclusive. And something that we're seeing now is the emergence of new movements, which, uh, which are more inclusive um, and that often have the social justice component. And so then often climate action and that, that part of sustainability, thinking about energy systems, that becomes closely linked with ideas about, um, about race, class, and gender justice. Um, you know, and there's a real opportunity there because, of course, then climate then can take us, as I've just been arguing, into thinking about, well, how do we manage landscapes with respect to, um, to climate? So, um, oh, do I have an opinion? Stan is asking me now, do I have an opinion about the biomass plant at Dartmouth? Um, I'm not sure what the plan currently is. I was on a committee that was charged with, um, with thinking that through, and I'm not, I, I suspect that that may be, the authorities may have, have stepped back a little bit to think about where they want to go with that over time. Do I have an opinion? I'd be, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think there's a real trade-off there. I mean, I see real value in renewable local energy, and in a lot of ways, you'd like to see um, you might want to see biomass as part of that. But on the other hand, in my own analysis, I'm concerned about the CO2 emissions from that. And the people like me who work on the accounting issues don't agree on how, which metrics to use and what they mean. And so then that's, uh, I don't want to say it's a can of worms, but I mean, that's just a real interesting, complicated one. And if we can use more solar and more wind, then we're probably in a better situation as long as we're not as long as we're not clearing too many forests to make room for windmills and, uh, and, and solar themselves. Um, that's the thing that with energy flows and landscapes, there's never, there's never any no cost solution. There's always a trade off somewhere or another. Um, okay, so Jane, um, Jane Henry has a question that I mentioned that houses should be closer to roads. And why is that? Well, I think about applied ecology, then there's this field conservation biology um, that's concerned with how you would design like a nature reserve um, or a park in ways that might provide optimal wildlife habitat. And key things that 
are in that practice are that one big integrated landscape is better than two smaller disconnected landscapes. Um, and so fragmentation really matters and roads really, um, roads really matter. Um, and I think also that if you see, um, if you see interior lots, often that means um, more clearing if the land is going on. I'm thinking that um, um, colleagues um, down at UNH, Mark Ducey and Ken Johnson, I believe, have done work on how suburbanization or exurban development, you're on maybe two or three acre lots or whatever the lot size is. Um, but often um, lots, you know, forests that are closer to, and more adjacent to homes tend to have lower carbon storage because they're just managed differently. Uh, and so I would say that being closer to the road means less ecological disturbance. Um, you know, that's, that would be my understanding, so. I think, Stan, Hugh, you had your hand up a while ago. No, thanks, Rob. Uh, you answered my question. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Well, Stan, OK. And you're sitting, Thank you, Rich. Do we my, you're sitting in my, in my in the, in the apartment over the our, our garage looking over at the mountain. So that's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for Rich? So these are good questions. I like them, so. Hey, I have a question. Rich, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I come across in real estate, um, you know, people who are buying large lots um, and there's, there's no control or I don't know that you could pass a law, but any kind of, um, I guess, law that says, you know, if you're going to build a house on 30 acres, so many times I see people putting in driveways to up the hill to where the view is and clear cutting 60% yep. of the land. And no, you know, I can't do anything or say anything because they own the land or I've sold it to them. And there have been example after example where there's there's nothing that you can do when somebody does that, although you you know wish that they would leave the trees in their property. And two examples that have really concerned me is have been on Three Mile Road where I live, and almost across the street from us there was the most beautiful 25 acre property that was great habitat, and a developer from out of state who contacted me um about the land bought it and clear cut the entire 25 acres and now there's erosion um and all th sorts of things that are going on in the property and then the homeowner across the street who had 15 acres and abuts us cleared the entire 15 acres which has caused all sorts of problems on our property with erosion and wildlife trails this is, this is up near the, just, I guess, a little bit south of Wolfboro Road. Is that the right area? Yeah. And yeah. You can actually see that I mean, from our yeah. house. I mean, what? You can actually see that from our house. I know, and it's, do we try, is there some way of educating people or is there some, you know, some type of law that can be passed or they have to go to the town before they just decide to clear cut? It might, it might partly be, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I've identified that from my professional perspective as an issue that needs to be solved. Obviously, you're pointing out very correctly that it's a real estate value or issue because, of course, there's such tremendous uh, financial value to a view lot. Right. So we either need to ban that through some kind of zoning rule, which would probably be hard to get through the town, or we need um, some kind of incentives or mechanisms. I mean, I think to some extent, to some extent, I mean, that's a place where maybe places, maybe that's a place we can look to spend conservation money, you know? So, you know, a client comes to a real estate agent, again, I'm speaking very hypothetically and says, I want to do this with my land. And you say, well, here's what the maximum financial value would be. But um, one thing that conservation organizations can do is to buy easements that um, don't eliminate the development rights, but they make sure that development is done in a, in a more environmentally sensitive way. 
Mm -hmm. We also need more affordable housing in this community. So if some of these instances lead to smaller homes that are in a different market segment, I mean, that's also interesting. That's hard to achieve, but these are the right kinds of questions to be having. And as a, a board member, I feel like one of my goals tonight was simply to start raising that question, which I don't think we know the answers to. Um, you know. So incentives, I think, you know, which yeah. you hit upon, you know, everything's financial for somebody who's going to build a home and buy a big piece of land. But if there are incentives to not clear cut all the land, I think, you know, you're appealing maybe to something that might help. Yeah. And that's, I think it used to be that conservation was mostly people donating their own land. And then it's nice that we can serve this parcel over here. Um, and part of my talk tonight is that actually we need to look at the landscape scale. Um, and that, that's hard to do because we live in, with this high degree of parcelization in like live free or die in Hampshire where property rights remain supreme. We have pretty good zoning rules, although they're not ideal perfect zoning rules. Um, I don't know, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation I think that we, I would like to participate in, so. So I have a question here from, uh, Carol Weinga, or Wein, Wein guys, sorry for mispronouncing your name. What do I think about uh, timber harvesting on the McBrook uh, Preserve land? Um, I haven't been in there. I don't know that site very well. Um, I would think that in the long run that you really want to do an assessment of what the potential carbon storage uh, is there. Um, it probably isn't monetizable. It might be. Um, I know that the, uh, I don't know the forester that's working on that. Um, Julie Evans with the Northern Forest Center though was very involved in the planning, the overall resource management plan. And, and she's, at, she's excellent. Um, you know, and so I, the, the short of it is that I wouldn't really oppose timber harvesting because I actually think that there certainly are cases where you actually need sustainable forest management practices in order to have healthy forests that are biodiverse and all of that. But I would do it conservatively and I would focus on the on carbon as kind of a leading uh, goal. So it's a clearer answer than I gave on the Dartmouth power plant. Sorry about that. Okay, so let me see, Ryan has a question. Okay, so Ryan asks about the balance between solar energy and wildlife. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think about, okay, your question, you're torn by seeing large farms being torn, turned, in, turned into solar. And I mean, you look at the controversy that they've had over in, um, is it Thetford, where they've had the town acquired the parcel that they were thinking about affordable housing and then for reasons that I don't completely understand, that didn't work out. And now they're thinking about a solar farm. Um, I mean, I think it depends. I mean, certainly there are sites where putting solar on roofs, obviously, but certainly on old fields can be appropriate. Um, although when I chose in my slides, I have that photo of the, or that the Audubon Society piece on loons. The other, um, the other bird species that I might've chosen instead is bobolink. And of course, they are dependent on having large intact hay fields um, in, um, in the summer. And it's not just that they need the large intact hay field, they also need the farmers to not hay it until, I guess, like mid to late July or something like that. Um, you know, and so I think, I think you do case by case analysis and you look, about, you look at the trade offs and what the, what the ecological value is of a given, of a given site. Um, and I also say that I'm a contrarian here, probably. I'm not sure that our region is um, I'm not sure our region is going to have a comparative advantage in solar, say. Um, and so, if we wind up buying uh, renewable energy contracts in the windmills, and many of the windmills and solar facilities are from some other state, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Although in those states, if it's Virginia where you say you come from, I mean, I, you, I do think that there's a land management issue there. Um, and if you go to a high proportion of of renewable energy, especially wind and solar, which are intermittent, then that then you can have a need to have a lot more transmission uh, capacity. Um, that relates to controversies like the Northern Pass controversy, which is of course going to get electrons from um, I guess James Bay 
down into Massachusetts and, and Connecticut. Um, and of course, that was, uh, that was a bit of a doozy, I think, the way that that one played out. Um, okay, so I'm not anti-solar, I hope that's clear. So, all right. Anybody else, any other questions for Rich? Well, that was great, uh, Rich, thank you. And I think um, really the, the amount of questions you got is evidence of the quality of the talk and how engaged your audience was because it's pretty impressive to get so many questions um, in a Zoom speech. And I'm- Well, thank really you. Impressed. Thank you for that, Heidi. I'm glad that, I'm glad that it hit the spot, so. And I think I can speak for everybody when we want you to say thank you to Kari for her photography and to keep it coming. Yeah, yeah, she's been, she's been, uh, yeah, she's been, she's been pretty fired up about that. So, all right. We're, we're very impressed. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you, Rich. Okay. So um, we just want to thank everybody for coming. And we have one more important item of business to attend to before we adjourn the meeting. Um, I don't know. Have everybody's aware, but 2020 marks our executive director Adair's 10th year as executive director as the Hanover Conservancy. And um, so tonight we want to celebrate and honor Adair for her dedication and commitment and exemplary work for our organization. Um, so 10 years ago, the board made the decision to hire its first full time executive director. And as we can see, this really turned out to be an excellent investment. Um, the Conservancy has really grown under Adair's leadership. Some examples of this, I'm just gonna throw out some numbers, but it's really hard to describe uh, the degree to which Adair has taken us to grown really in every way and become a really professional organization and done, made a really meaningful impact on our community. Um, including in this is protecting an additional 700 acres um, increasing membership by more than 200 households. And I think that number might even be greater since we wrote this script because membership has been increasing very recently. Um, we've had a fourfold growth in trips and program participation. The assets have doubled and our revenue has tripled. Um, we've hired a second staff member, Courtney. And we all know that Adair's grant writing talents are amazing and she's raised more than $400,000 for land conservation and stewardship and strategic planning um, in our area. And so Adair, we wish we could do this in person, but because we are on Zoom, uh, we have a special gift for you if you see coming in behind you. Um, and so here, there is a gift here for you, and there should also be something arriving in your email. Um, it's there. Excellent. The, yeah, so go ahead and open the box. You caught me by surprise. I, I'm not being very dignified about this. Thank, thank you very much. I'm not being very dignified. Um, oh, my goodness. Okay, so I will explain. So this is this green necklace is a very thoughtful idea of our longtime conservancy member, Gail McPeak. Oh, Gail never fails. Gail. No, and Gail has <laughs> very thoughtful. Gail, Gail says that the necklace symbolizes the green necklace of conserved land surrounding the core urban part of Hanover. And that nearly 60 years ago, our membership organization began with the stated goal of protecting these natural lands in order to provide recreation and breathing space for our community. And Adair, with your guidance and leadership over the past 10 years, this green necklace of conserved lands has grown and is almost complete in Hanover um, and grows to include significant natural areas in rural Hanover and around the urban core. Um, Gail also says the necklace, the stone Amazonite is um, symbolic of the stone of hope, and it's a symbol of hope and faith for those who wear it. So we want to thank you, Adair, and I would just like everybody to please, you know, let's acknowledge Adair with our silent <laughs> Zoom clapping. Um, thank you. So grateful for you. Oh my goodness, I, um, I, I have no speech prepared, um, and you don't want to let me go and do that. Um, I, th this is, this, I can't tell you what this means to me, and, and, um, and I will just say that this is the most wonderful job I've ever had in all the years that I've been so fortunate to work 
in the environmental field. Um, every single last one of my years since I graduated from college has been in the environmental field. And um, this has been far and away the most rewarding and enriching and illuminating um, opportunity I've ever had. And I treasure it deeply. Thank you well, so much. We are so lucky to have you and um, we, we can't wait for 10 more years. So oh, okay. congratulations. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> so you should see a um, in your email, there's a video tribute and um, you'll be able to watch that at your leisure. Oh, good grief. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. There is no end to the imagination here. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you for everybody sharing this moment with me. Oh my goodness, now you're all family. So with that, we just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Thank you, Rich, for the speech. And um, the meeting is recorded. So if you know anybody who missed it, they will be able to go onto our website. I think Courtney's going to post it tonight and see the recording of tonight's talk. So thank All you right. for joining us and um, have a nice evening. Thank you.